Haskell offers several expression types that make defining functions concise and elegant. There are many examples of such definitions in the book. In this video, we'll look at different ways of expressing each of several functions. At the end, we'll present some general purpose templates for these expression types. Here's our first function, defined using syntax we already understand. It tells us whether a list is in increasing order. The type signature tells us that for any ordered type A, our function takes a list of A's and returns a bool. The definition itself contains a deeply nested if-then-else statement. The empty list is increasing, as is a list of one item. Otherwise, if the first item is less than or equal to the second item, then the list is increasing if the tail of the list is increasing. Finally, if none of the above apply, the list is not increasing. This is a recursive function. It is defined in terms of itself. I'm assuming you've run into recursion before, even if you're not entirely comfortable with it. We'll talk about recursion in more detail in the next chapter. Our function can be written much more elegantly using Haskell's pattern matching syntax. We simply list a series of patterns that the input might match. Again, this says that the empty list is increasing, as is a list of one item. Otherwise, the list must have a first item x, a second item y, and the rest of the list called y's. In that case, the list is increasing if x is less than or equal to y, and the tail of the list is also increasing. By the way, parentheses are required when we match several things at once. In evaluating a call to increasing, Haskell goes through the list of patterns until it finds one that matches. For example, if we ask for The first pattern doesn't match, but the second one does, with x being 5, so the expression evaluates to true. Since Haskell goes through the patterns in order, we can be even more concise. This handles the case where the list has at least two items, then says that any other list is increasing. The underscore matches everything. For clarity, we use this when we don't care what we matched. Here's a function that takes a string and returns the same string with no vowels. This says if word is the empty string, just return it. Otherwise, if the first letter is a vowel, return the rest of word without vowels. If it's not, return the first letter plus the rest of word without vowels. Let's give it a try. Here it is with pattern matching. We don't have to constantly use head and tail to take apart the word because the pattern matcher has already broken it down into x, the first letter, and x's, the rest of the word. We can also use guards to specify a series of conditions and what we should do in each case. After each vertical pipe is a Boolean condition, an equal sign, and what the function returns in that case. We only have two conditions, including the default otherwise here, but we could have any number. This is analogous to a cond statement in Lisp or Scheme. Our next function calls out the report of the night watch. Occasionally, there's cause for alarm. The show function converts the int n into a string. Let's try it out. Here it is with pattern matching. We can avoid a small amount of redundancy by using a WHERE expression. This gives a single expression, then defines a function used in that expression. Is this clear? In this situation it's a matter of taste, but sometimes one version will be significantly more concise. Yet another way to write this function involves a case statement, which is like a switch statement in C or Java. 
This lists several possibilities for n, along with a value for each one. Again, an underscore matches anything. Here's one last function, which calculates the acceleration due to gravity at distance r from the center of the Earth. The first mysterious number is the universal gravitational constant. The second one is the mass of the Earth. We can test this function by passing it the radius of the Earth. That's about right. The function would debatably be clearer if we gave those constants names using a let expression. We could have just defined these as global constants on separate lines. The advantage of let is that the binding is only visible within the scope of the let statement. Good names are hard to come by, so it's better to define things as locally as possible. Examples are good. The best way to learn is to solve more problems using these techniques. If you prefer explicit rules, though, you might appreciate some templates. A definition looks like this. It's okay to list several different patterns involving the same function name as we did with increasing. The patterns should be exhaustive so that no cases slip through the cracks. It's therefore a good idea to have the last pattern match everything. A guard expression looks like this. Actually, the otherwise clause isn't required, but it's a good idea to make sure that the rule is exhaustive. A WHERE clause looks like this. A WHERE clause can only be used inside a definition. WHERE clauses cannot be nested. A LET expression looks like this. LET expressions can be used anywhere and can be nested. Finally, a CASE expression looks like this. One last tip to help with your debugging. Unlike most languages, Haskell cares about indentation. Corresponding parts should be indented to the same level, with subordinate parts indented further. For example, this is OK, but this is not. To avoid mysterious behavior, Make sure your editor is always using spaces, not tabs, for indentation.